seats. We are pleased to offer this event with simultaneous interpretation. Please find a headset at your, your seat and tune in channel one for English and channel two for Japanese. If there's any problem with your headset, please find a member of our staff to assist you. Konnichiwa. Good afternoon. Uh, this event uh, is uh, um, provided with simultaneous interpretation. Uh, please find a headset at your seat. Uh, Japanese will be provided from channel two, English from channel one. If your headset has any issues, then please uh, uh, catch one of the staffs. Communications and operations at the Japan International Transport and Tourism Institute. USA or GT USA. Please allow me to welcome you to today's symposium, which is being held with support from the Nippon Foundation, the Embassy of Japan in the United States, the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism of Japan, and the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center. We thank each of these organizations for their generous support. To open our symposium, Mr. Masafumi Shikuri, Chairman of GTUSA and the Japan International Transport and Tourism Research, Research Institute, JTTRI, would like to make some remarks. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Shikuri. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Masahumi Shikuri, the chairman of Japan Transport and Tourism Research Institute and the Japan International Transport and Tourism Institute, USA. As some of you may be aware, aware our organization's name was recently amended in August in order to show that tourism is included included in our activities. We thank you for your continued support as we proceed in our efforts to conduct research on international transport and tourism issues and disseminate information to the public through publications and events such as the one today. As a host of this symposium, I welcome you all here today to the 2019 Civil Aviation Symposium, the future of civil aviation in the Asia Pacific region. I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to the Honorable Shinsuke Sugiyama, Ambassador of Japan to the United States, and the Honorable Hugo Yong, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Transportation Affairs at the U.S. Department of State for their participation and the generosity of their time. In addition, I would like to express thanks to the three distinguished keynote speakers. David Short, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Aviation and International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Transportation. Jotaro Horiuchi, Assistant Vice Minister for International Affairs, International Civil Aviation at the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism of Japan. And Akihiko Tamura, President and CEO of Narita International Airport Corporation. I also extend my appreciation for the U.S. and Japanese airline representatives who, despite their busy schedules, are participating as panelists in the panel discussion. They will be introduced later in the program. With regard to today's theme of civil aviation in the Asia Pacific, competition among airlines and airports has been drastically increasing. Air passenger transport in the region reached 1.6 billion passengers in 20, 2018, 
and is expected to grow further in the future. Regarding civil aviation and airport policies in Japan, with the 2020 Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games being held in the near future, the functionality of Tokyo Metropolitan Airports has been enhanced through the addition of landing slots at both Haneda and Narita Airport. And other policies are currently being implemented in order to address increasing aviation demands. In particular, regarding Haneda Airport, an aviation agreement was reached in negotiations between the US and Japan this August. I believe that the outcome of the agreement, which allocated 24 out of the uh, 50 new flights to air routes between the US and Japan, more than any other country, clearly shows that for Japan, there is a vital importance to have a aviation transport with the US. The further expansion of aviation transport between the US and Japan will surely be important for the development of economic activities and people-to-people -people exchanges between our two countries. However, I also strongly believe that it is an essential and effective tool to strengthen the crucial alliance that is the US-Japan relationship and to improve international security considering changes in recent global power dynamics. It is vital that we, we consider what kind of role the American and Japanese aviation sectors should play in the Asia-Pacific region and how they can contribute to even further development of relations between the US and Japan. Therefore, I look forward to hearing the speakers and the panelists talk about concerns and issues to watch in our shared region. And I believe that they will be produce beneficial suggestions for the direction that civil aviation should take in the Asian Pacific region and further strengthen the relationship between the US and Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shikuri. Now I have the honor to introduce to you the Ambassador of Japan to the United States, Shinsuke Sugiyama. Under his leadership, we have witnessed the current era of increased connections between the United States and Japan, certainly in the field of aviation, but in relationships as a whole. We feel grateful for his presence. Ambassador Sugiyama, if you could give your remarks. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, Chairman Shikuri has been uh, really, really kind to me. Uh, uh, of course, even before I became an envoy to the United States of America, but he, uh, particularly after uh, I arrived at the Dallas airport, uh, which was something like 19 months ago or something. And uh, this happens to be not only the, the first time when uh, uh, Chairman Shikuri was kind enough to invite me to this type of you know, important seminar uh, on uh, civil aviation today, uh, but on tourism and uh, things like that. So uh, I really, really uh, appreciate uh, uh, the other uh, Chairman Shikri, uh, uh, who uh, hosts uh, this afternoon's really, uh, very fruitful and meaningful discussions and symposium. I know that today's symposium is held through his efforts, and for that matter, I thank Chairman Shikri very much. Um, before uh, getting into anything else uh, uh, on this uh, particular uh, subject matter today, uh, please uh, allow me uh, to report to you that uh, yesterday was uh, my very big day uh, in the sense that uh, I was instructed by my government uh, to sign the formal international uh, agreements 
uh, on trade as well as the uh, digital uh, trade and the related documents attached to these uh, agreements. Uh, together with the uh, USTL uh, Ambassador Bob Lighthizer in the White House, in uh, just uh, uh, in the presence of the uh, Mr. President. And then I had an honor uh, to uh, talk to him privately, and I had uh, very much honor to speak up on behalf of my country and my uh, government uh, to tell the significant meaning of finalizing the legal documents by my signature uh, together with the uh, Bob Leiter as a signature. Of course, for us, uh, it is not the end of the, uh, the game. Uh, we must uh, present these documents to our national diet, uh, our parliament, to get approval. I'm told by Bob uh, that uh, in this case, uh, uh, US federal government uh, is not necessarily uh, putting that into a, a congressional approval. Uh, but uh, in our case, uh, we have to still uh, wait and to see how the diet debate uh, uh, is going to look like. But uh, my government, uh, uh, starting from my prime minister and the uh, minister in charge, Mr. Motegi, who happens to be my boss for minister, uh, very much sort of you know, uh, confident that uh, that does go through uh, sometime, uh, hopefully uh, rather soon. Um, this is not something uh, direct to do with the uh, civil aviation uh, agenda, but uh, this is something about the uh, whole sort of you know uh, bilateral uh, uh, trade, uh, such as industrial goods or agricultural goods. Uh, plus uh, e-commerce. So uh, uh, although this is uh, nothing direct to do with the, uh, today's topic, but I do believe that uh, if these get into force uh, sometime in the near future to come after uh, getting approval uh, from a national diet, uh, our kind of battle situation in terms of economic relation is going to be even much, much better and even much, much deeper. Uh, we haven't counted on uh, uh, specific numbers, but uh, uh, what uh, Bob Wright has been saying that uh, the amount of the volumes involved in the agricultural sector for the U.S. is up uh, to some, something like seven billion, not million. So, uh, uh, of course, um, if you compare these uh, to a, 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 a giant neighbor, uh, the, the, the figure is not that much big enough uh, in comparison to these, but nonetheless, seven billion as such only on agricultural sector, uh, plus industrial sectors or something. I don't know how, how much many, but it is, uh, to, to, say, to say the least, it is not peanut. So, plus some of the uh, symbolism that uh, we've, uh, we are about to get into for uh, uh, force on the uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, free and open trade system uh, strengthened uh, by the, these agreements, if these agreements uh, get into force in the near future to come. So this is something at the outset that I personally uh, feel very much honored that uh, I happen to be a signatory um, on behalf of my government uh, in front of your president together with uh, Bob Lighthizer uh, that's something that I am uh, very much sort of proudly uh, uh, want to uh, report to you all um, who are uh, gathered here. Now, uh, this uh, civil aviation thing. I saw a quote the other day that I liked, although I don't know who said that. Of all the books in the world, best, the best stories are found between the pages of Passport. A passport is a book of stories and memories written by each of us in our travels. It is a book of knowledge, history, geography. It is a book of understanding. By the way, uh, since I came here, I am uh, not that much uh, using passport, except that I have to go to White House or something to show my identification, not for the travel's uh, uh, sake. But when I was uh, back in Tokyo, particularly serving as uh, deputy foreign minister, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister of Japan uh, is supposed to first accompany all the time and the Prime Minister goes outside to see uh, his opposite numbers and every time. Uh, and uh, 
uh, not only that, but uh, Deputy uh, Foreign Minister is a person who is supposed to make a whole sort of, you know, sub cabinet level uh, consultation with a whole numbers of the uh, uh, foreign uh, uh, opposite numbers. So uh, my one time uh, secretary counted that uh, annually I used to travel uh, something like 50 times or so. Uh, and then uh, I'm told that uh, it's about the same of uh, cabin attendant. Uh, so I, uh, I, I was something like uh, working as a cabin attendant. But uh, don't, don't worry, cabin attendants uh, can have a rest for two days or one day or something while on land, uh, while I have to work uh, upon arrival and uh, even before uh, uh, leaving. So uh, I had a very sort of, you know, uh, uh, physically, uh, not uh, necessarily, uh, you know, mentally or something, but uh, physically I had a very sort of, you know, physical schedule. But that was the time and found out that my passports were three books uh, because of the stamps and because of uh, visas and because of everything else. So really I feel uh, this word is true, that when you just uh, page back to the stamps or, or you know, the name of the country, so these sort of things, I, uh, I was able to remember where I was going to, whom uh, I, I, I was meeting. Uh, not 100% uh, these days I'm aging, so I forget everything uh, so easily, but nonetheless, the passports tell you the story. You are, are here in this room under this uh, uh, title of uh, Civil Aviation Symposium, serve the larger purpose of helping write that book. And as Japan's uh, envoy to the United States of America, I thank you also. Fulfilling larger purposes, of course, often requires the nitty gritty of reaching agreement on the per, uh, practicalities and details. In August, I understand, this August, Japan and the United States of America authorities reached an important uh, agreement of uh, record of decision to the effect that the amendment to the schedule of uh, the uh, civil air transportation agreement uh, should be done accordingly. Uh, 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 finalizing uh, exchange of notes uh, is ex expected to be done, uh, I'm told, uh, uh, sooner than later, uh, which is going to be enhanced uh, uh, further the other uh, uh, cooperation uh, uh, on this particular field between the two countries. You see, as I uh, said uh, from the podium in front of the, uh, uh, your uh, president and then my colleague uh, Bob Lighthizer, that U.S. is the single ally to us, bar none. Uh, and then of course, uh, Premier Japan is at least one of the most important friendly allies, uh, uh, not only in this particular civil aviation uh, field, but uh, everything else. So I'm very much proud that uh, uh, you are going to uh, make the uh, significant sort of an amendment to the schedule to expand uh, the uh, civil aviation corporations. And I was uh, briefed uh, what it's all about uh, uh, in substances. The result uh, uh, the, uh, uh, of uh, their work is that uh, with the expanded use of Haneda Airport, the number of routes connecting Japan and the US will increase really, really significantly. And I do believe that it is only sort of you know, natural I see, I'm, 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 I'm being told when I was uh, Tokyo and uh, even after I came here that the total number of inbound tourists, we used to have a target of uh, 40,000 uh, 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 people or something and, and then I think we have already achieved that. And then uh, given the fact that next year happens to be Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics and the number uh, is expected and then should be uh, increasing really, really rapidly. So this is really, I do believe, a uh, timely thing. Uh, maybe uh, the early part of next uh, year or something, the new kind of schedule is going to be done, and then the expanded kind of routes and expanded uh, 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 flights and something, uh, 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 particularly uh, uh, Haneda Airport and Narita Airport too, uh, uh, is of the uh, uh, primarily only natural, but. At, at the same time uh, of the utmost importance for that matter. 24 out of the uh, 50 new flights per day will be devoted to Japan-US routes. This will deepen the relationship between our two countries throughout the Asia-Pacific region. I might add that Narita International Airport 
uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, president and CEO, uh, uh, the, uh, Mr. Tamra, uh, is uh, uh, present here. And I do understand that uh, Mr. Tamra, together with others, uh, are going to be speaking up uh, after this. But um, I do uh, believe that uh, Narita International Port already has an expensive international network, and I understand it's planning to build a new runway and expand flights even further. So not only limited to Haneda, but also presumably uh, a long, uh, longer history international airport, uh, a kind of you know, a hub uh, in the region uh, uh, of uh, Narita uh, International Airport is uh, surely going to be uh, playing much, much more important role in terms of the tourism, in terms of business trip, in terms of everything else. We are fortunate to have Mr. Tamil, as I said, the President and CEO of Narita International Airport Corporation with us today and perhaps he will give us his thoughts uh, much, much in detail and much, much in, uh, from the viewpoint of uh, not me as a layman, but uh, him as an expert on, on that matter. I hope these uh, efforts will lead the airports uh, in Tokyo metropolitan area to become the hub. And already I think uh, the, uh, because of these two airports, and particularly uh, starting from Narita to be uh, followed by Haneda, uh, I think uh, uh, Tokyo uh, has been playing the important role of a hub in the region. But I do believe that presumably, thanks to uh, Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics and everything else, uh, even rugby, uh, amazing enough, uh, Japanese rugby team seems to be doing really, really well. Uh, used to beat in South Africa and has beaten the uh, number two, uh, Ireland. So uh, I think they seem to be doing, and that means that presumably they are gathering uh, more and more tourists. Uh, that means that uh, Air, air, uh, airplane companies as well as uh, airports are uh, too uh, 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 becoming uh, uh, even uh, busier. Um, so uh, the, uh, uh, I hope these efforts will lead the airports in Tokyo Metropolitan, as I said, uh, uh, these are hard. We at the embassy want to see planes full of Japanese and American flyer back and forth between our two countries. Every person getting off one of these planes, either going east or west, is a source of closer ties and understanding. Mark Twain once said that too much of anything is bad, but too much, too much good whiskey was barely enough. This is how I see trouble between countries. So I support everybody here, and I thank you, and particularly Mr. Chairman, uh, 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 the uh, other president and CEOs and uh, uh, secretaries uh, who are gathering uh, uh, for all that you do. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Ambassador Sugiyama. Next in our program, we have the honor to hear from Mr. Higo Yon. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Transportation Affairs from the United States Department of State. We are delighted that he could join us today and commend his efforts in the fields of foreign relations and transportation. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Yon. Chairman Shakuri. On behalf of the U.S. government, thank you for your warm welcome to this event. Ambassador Sugiyama, Assistant Vice Minister Hiroyuchi, Deputy Assistant Secretary David Short, distinguished panelists and guests, and ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. As stated already, Japan has a critical role in the growth of aviation in the Asia Pacific region. There are three reasons why. First is the U.S.-Japan alliance. Second are the people-to-people -people and commercial ties that Japan fosters. And third is the concept of Japan as a gateway to Asia. First, the, the U.S.-Japan alliance. It is the cornerstone of peace and security in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. Our bilateral relationship has never been stronger, and we have built a truly global partnership based on cooperation and on providing security and stability for our countries and the wider region. That stability, in turn, provides a foundation 
for the extensive economic relationship that our two countries enjoy and a framework for regional growth, especially in the aviation sector. Japan also continues to foster strong economic uh, growth and people-to-people -people ties with countries like the United States. Um, and it's because of this common desire to deepen these types of ties that for years, the United States and Japanese flights in and out of downtown Tokyo's Haneda's uh, airport cannot keep up with demand. For this reason, I want to take a moment to applaud the flexibility of the governments of both the United States and Japan and all that it took in the recent aviation discussions to open up these new opportunities. In exercising this flexibility, our countries were able to maximize aviation growth and the commercial benefits for U.S. and Japanese stakeholders, in addition to expanding capacity for other countries to come to Tokyo. It is truly a great example to the world of how partners can both compete and cooperate in a way that is very sustainable over time. It is difficult for me to overstate the importance of additional daytime service at Haneda. These flights will generate billions of dollars of economic activity in and outside of the aviation sector. Well, it will enable travel to the 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo. It will help Japan achieve its goal of 60 million tourists by 2030 and create additional direct access to central Tokyo for cities in the United States. And I can say personally that I would be very interested in boarding any new flight from Washington, D.C. to Haneda or from any of the new destinations and cities that we will touch. Once the new flights are in place, we will all have a stake in seeing that those flights, as Ambassador has said, are full in both directions. And I believe the new U.S. destinations available by direct flight out of central Tokyo are an exciting development for Japanese tourists and regional business travelers. I welcome the new visitors to the United States. And that brings me to the third reason for Japan's critical role in the coming decades. Japan has a near perfect location to be a gateway to Asia, a role that greater Tokyo area has served for many decades. Um, as rising tides raise all ships, and in so much as Japan is a gateway to Asia, the Haneda and Narita airports are partners that complement each other. The new slots at Haneda have only expanded the pie for all airports in Japan, in addition to creating new options for international customers. But, but, but Japan isn't only a gateway to Asia for passengers. It is also a window to the world for air cargo. Japan's domestic demand for foreign goods has grown over the years. Thirst around the world for Japanese products similarly has increased. Indeed, Japan, like the United States, is one of the very few drivers of global economic demand. Japan has facilitated the movement of cargo to meet these growing demands. Japan has demonstrated in recent talks with the United States its continued support for allowing air cargo carriers to operate flexibly out of Japan in order to serve this regional market and be this window. We need to keep cargo growing in step with increased passenger travel. And it is even more important now that our two countries just signed a new trade agreement and digital trade agreement. Many of those products are going to be high value added products that go on air cargo. Right. And as President Trump has said, and I quote, this is a tremendous victory for both our nations. I started my remarks looking toward Japan's role in the bright future of aviation in the Asia Pacific region. That future is indeed bright because there are so many stakeholders like uh, JITTI um, and like each of you who are all looking for new ways to expand travel from, within, and to the region. Thank you again, Chairman Shikuri, for hosting this symposium today. I look forward to the lively discussions, and I also look forward to the future of aviation for our two countries and the region and the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Yon. 
As you see in our agenda, the symposium consists of two sessions, the keynote speeches and the panel discussion. For the first session, we have assembled three speakers with expertise in the fields of civil aviation who have insight into how things are moving forward, particularly in the Asia Pacific region. Our first keynote speaker is Mr. Joel Taro Horiuchi, Assistant Vice Minister for International Aviation at the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport, and Tourism of Japan. He will be followed by Mr. David Short, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Aviation and International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Transportation. And lastly, our third and final speaker for this portion of the symposium will be Mr. Akiko Tamura, President and CEO of Narita International Airport Corporation. We feel deeply grateful for each of their efforts to be here today and the generosity of their time. A coffee break will follow the keynote speeches and then we'll have a panel discussion with closing remarks from our moderator, which I will describe further at that point in the program. Now please join me in welcoming the first of our keynote speakers, Mr. Horiuchi, to the stage. Uh, Mr. Matsufumi Shukri, uh, Chairman of uh, JTTRI, uh, His Excellency uh, Shinichi Sugiyama, our uh, Ambassador of Jap Japan to the United States, and uh, uh, Mr. Higuyon, our Deputy Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Department of State, and, and uh, our distinguished guests from the government, the industries, and the academia. Uh, it is a great honor for me to make a presentation on such this occasion. And I'd like to talk on the, our future prospect of um, our Asia Pacific regions, our air traffic. And uh, so I'd like to straight to the point. Okay. Mm. Uh, the, this page, uh, the global passenger traffic uh, has been right, has risen sharply uh, these days. Uh, let's take a look at the evolution of the main interregional tra traffics. Uh, firstly, the traffic between Europe and Asia has grown by 35% in the past eight years. Uh, secondly, the traffic between Europe and A Asia, no, Europe and North America has grown by 42% in the same period. And finally, uh, the growth rate of the traffic between North America and Asia was 62%, the largest growth among the three. I would also like to note that the passenger traffic between North America and Asia is mostly by air, uh, simply because they are not adjoining uh, to each other. Now I'd like to start by focusing on the current situation and uh, prospect of air traffic within the Asia Pacific region, uh, especially the air traffic between the United States and Southeast Asia. Uh, then I'd like to highlight the potential role of Japanese main airports. Uh, in 2003, uh, then Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi launched the Visit Japan campaign. Uh, that was the year when the American movie Lost in Translation was released. In that movie, Japan was described as a country uh, where you can't, make yourself and you can't make yourself understood in English and you feel isolated. Uh, through the nationwide campaign, the Japanese government and the tourism industry in Japan have made great efforts to improve signage and operate day tours in foreign languages and to promote Japan as an attractive tourism destination for international tourists. As a result, the number of international tourists in 2018 has risen to over 30 million, about six times as much as those in 2003. Uh, the Japanese government had an ambitious target of the number of tourists, 40 million in 2020 and 60 million in 2030. Uh, you might think the growth uh, comes mostly from Asian countries, but that's not always the case. As a matter of fact, international tourists from the U.S. to Japan reached 
700,000 in 2010. Uh, the figure tentatively dropped because of the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011, uh, but it has steadily increased since then and reached the highest level of 1.5 million uh, in 2018, more than double the figure in 2010. Uh, international tourists from East Asia to Japan have increased fourfold to 22.9 million. And those who, from Southeast Asia to Japan uh, have also increased sixfold to 3.5 million. Uh, this sharp rise of the number of international tourists has led to the increase of the number of international flights to and from Japan. Uh, this view graph shows the number of the direct flights per week between Southeast Asia and Japan in the 2010 summer schedule. If we compare the weekly, weekly flights to daily ones, uh, 15 daily flights from Bangkok and 11 from Singapore, and, but not so many from other cities. When we see the figures of the 2019 summer schedule, we have 35 daily flights from Bangkok 25 from Singapore, and 20 from Manila. In addition to that, the daily direct flights to Japan from Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh, and Kuala Lumpur have reached around 10 respectively. Uh, furthermore, Phnom Penh, Yangon, and Bandar Sri Bugawan are now operating direct flights to Japan, and Vientiane, the capital of Laos, will start to operate direct flights to Japan in the 2019 winter schedule. As a result, all of the ASEAN countries will be connected to Japan by direct flight. Uh, next, uh, let's look at the direct flight between the US mainland and Japan. In the 2010 summer schedule, we already had direct flight from 12 cities with one or more daily operation. In the 2019 summer schedule, we have about 20% more flights from the US to Japan partly because of the increase of flights from Los Angeles and Seattle. Also Denver, Boston, and San Diego are now served by direct flight to Japan. I would like to move to the topic of direct flight between the US and Southeast Asia. As the flight range of narrow body aircraft with small capacity has been extended thanks to technical innovation, including energy saving. Uh, the number of direct flights between the US and Southeast Asia has been increasing, but there are still only two Southeast Asian cities, Manila and Singapore, which are connected with US cities by direct flights. Uh, I think the number of the direct flights between the US and Southeast Asia will continue to increase, but due to the long flight hours of 16 to 18, and due to the constraint that narrow body aircraft require high revenue per passenger. Uh, the number of non-stop flights connecting the US and Southeast Asia will possibly be limited to a certain extent. Rather, both uh, non-stop flights and indirect, indirect flights using connecting hubs are likely to prosper and share the total demand properly. Japan has a geographical advantage to serve as a connecting hub between North America and Southeast Asia. While a limited number of routes could be connected directly between the US and Southeast Asia, a sharp increase in direct flight between Southeast Asia and Japan and between the US and Japan will offer air passengers workable alternatives by using Japan as a connecting hub. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce the overview of Japanese airports and to pick up some Japanese airports which are prospective connecting hubs between North America and Southeast Asia. The largest airport in terms of number of passengers in Japan is Haneda. Uh, the second largest is Narita. Both are located in the Tokyo metropolitan area. Having said that, uh, Haneda is mainly for domestic passengers. As an international airport, Narita has the largest number of passengers and Kansai Osaka follows. As you may be aware, slots at Haneda for international flights will be increased from the 2020 summer schedule, but there is no additional plans to expand the capacity of Haneda. Meanwhile, Narita has an ambitious plan to increase capacity in the next 10 years. 
Therefore, I am looking to Narita for the future role of, of becoming the connecting hub. Additionally, I think Kansai, Osaka, and Chubu Nagoya have potential to be next connecting hubs. The Japanese government has a target to increase the number of takeoffs and landing of Tokyo Metropolitan Airport from the current number of 747,000 to approximately 1 million by the late 2020s. The capacity of Haneda will expand it from 447,000 to approximately uh, 490,000 and fly and from the 2020 summer schedule. All of the expanded capacity will be used for international flights, but there is no further expansion plan uh, for Haneda from this point onwards. On the other hand, the capacity of Narita will be increased by 40,000 by 2020 and will reach 500,000 in the 2020s, uh, late 2020s, more than 60% increase of capacity compared with that in 2019. A new third runway will be completed by them. Uh, with regard to Narita, I'd like to omit the detailed explanations because Mr. Tamura, a Narita Airport CEO, will cover them. One thing I'd like to tell you is that substantial efforts are being made to improve the access to central Tokyo and to increase domestic flights to and from Narita. Uh, the next topic is Kansai International Airport in Osaka. Uh, it is a 24-hour airport with two runways of 4,000 meters and 3,500 meters long. I mentioned earlier that the current number of flights between Southeast Asia and Japan is 903 flights per week, among them around 190 flights, more than 20% of the total are from Kansai airports. Kansai airports still have plenty of capacity remaining. Kansai is also the gateway for Kyoto, the prominent old capital. Therefore, I believe Kansai airport has high potential to be a connecting hub between North America and Southeast Asia. Uh, the next airport I will introduce is Chubu Centria International Airport in Nagoya. Uh, the great Nagoya's, greater Nagoya region is a hub of Japanese major manufacturing industries as, such as Toyota, Mitsubishi, heavy industries, and Yamaha. About 10 million people live in the greater Nagoya region within the radius of 100 kilometers. Chubu Airport is also close to the traditional ninja towns. They engage in the ninja project to host and entertain international tourists. Uh, Chubu has around 80 flights per week between Southeast Asia and Japan. Uh, the destinations are Bangkok, Manila, Singapore, Hanoi, and so on. I have no doubt that Chubu is an airport which also has hidden potential to become a connecting hub between North America and Southeast Asia. Uh, I just would like to touch upon a lot more attractive spots in Japan raising ranging north and south. For example, in Kyushu, southern part of Japan islands, you can enjoy the food culture uh, in win uh, represented by ramen noodles and a variety of hot springs as well. And if you look at the north, uh, you will find Hokkaido, where the Sapporo Snow Festival and skiing in winter are very popular among international tourists and Fukuoka airports in Kyushu and New Chitose Airport in Hokkaido are the main airports in the region, attracting many tourists in association with other airports. All of the airports are constituting the well-developed domestic network between the metropolitan airports Haneda and Narita. Uh, this biograph shows two different approaches. While MLIT is promoting integrated airport management by outsourcing to private, private sectors for greater efficiency, we are taking another measure to introduce advanced technology to facilitate procedures at airports, what we call fast travel. Uh, in summary, here are the, the key me message I'd like to deliver to all of you. Uh, first, human exchanges. Uh, between Japan and Southeast Asian countries are growing rapidly, uh, enhancing the aviation 
networks between the two regions. Second, by building up robust network with Japanese cities, uh, US and Japanese carriers could make full use of the enhanced aviation networks between Japan and Southeast Asian countries. In this context, our US and Japanese carriers would contribute to strengthening business ties between US and rapidly growing Southeast Asian countries. I believe it is certainly good news for US carriers that flights to Haneda will increase next year. However, at the same time, uh, in view of a long-term development, I'd like, to, I'd like you to seriously think about the uh, strategic, strategic use of Japanese airports uh, besides Haneda to enhance global aviation networks. Thank you very much. We will now have the pleasure of hearing from Deputy Assistant Secretary Short. Uh, please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Good afternoon. I would like to start by thanking the Japan International Transport and Tourism Institute for inviting me to represent the US Department of Transportation at today's event. As many of you know, DOT and JITI have a long history of cooperation, and so I am very happy to be able to participate in this important discussion hosted by such a prestigious institution. I would like to personally thank Mr. Shukuri and his team for organizing this event. I would also like to acknowledge His Excellency Ambassador Sugiyama and Assistant Vice Minister Horiyuchi, who both worked tirelessly with us over the course of the last couple of years to reach our landmark 2019 amendment to the US-Japan Air Transport Agreement. Without your efforts, we would not be here today. I would also like to express my gratitude to Mr. Yamauchi and his staff, as well as Mr. Tamura for their efforts to make this symposium a reality. The timing of the symposium today is particularly auspicious, given that my boss, Secretary of Transportation Elaine L. Chow, has been designated by President Trump to lead the US delegation to the enthronement of His Majesty Emperor Naruhito later this month. This honor highlights the importance and the excellent state of the transportation relationship between our two countries. This year has been a busy one for US-Japan air transport relations, and it represents the eve of a momentous new chapter in our aviation relationship. This is a relationship that has evolved remarkably over the last 70 years. But throughout this evolution, it has remained one of the most important aviation relationships for the United States. Before I share my thoughts on the future of aviation in Trans-Pacific air transport markets, I would like to recount some important facts about the history of the US-Japan aviation relationship, as it holds important lessons that should be considered as we look ahead. Since the beginning of intercontinental commercial aviation, the US-Japan relationship has formed the backbone of the Trans-Pacific market. This is in spite of the restricted air services relationship we once shared. When the 1952 US-Japan Civil Air Transport Agreement first entered into force, it placed significant limitations on the airlines of both countries in terms of how they could serve the market. US carriers, for instance, were permitted only one gateway in Japan, Tokyo, and Japanese carriers were able to serve only three US cities, Honolulu, San Francisco, and Seattle. The routings which they could fly between our countries were also heavily restricted, with only a small positive list of permitted intermediate points. 
these restrict restrictions were reflective of the technology limitations and the relatively small size of the Trans-Pacific market at that time. That said, these same technology limitations meant that the vast majority of traffic between just about anywhere in East Asia and the United States had to transit Japan. It was a matter of simple geography. When you consider this fact in relation to what our agreement allowed for at the time, you can really appreciate how much trans-Pacific traffic flows have grown and transformed over the last 70 years. Later in the 20th century, as the trans-Pacific market began to develop further, our transport relationship evolved. I say evolved rather than liberalized, because while certain re restrictions were relaxed, new restrictions were introduced. For instance, in 1972, while Japanese carriers gained access to New York and US carriers gained access to Osaka and Okinawa, new limitations were placed on the points beyond our respective countries that could be served. 1985 saw the first introduction of cargo-specific operating rights and the introduction of new gateways for passenger services. But this agreement also introduced frequency limitations into our air transport market for the first time. Tracing the history of our air service relationship through these various agreements provides insight into the mentality that drove our international aviation policy over this period. In short, government regulators negotiated only as much capacity and flexibility as they determined the market could accommodate. While one could argue this produced market stability at a time when long haul travel was a relatively new phenomenon, it also drove market inefficiencies and created clear winners and losers, excluding many potential competitors from the market outright. What this era precluded in the way of foregone market development and innovation, we will never know. With this as context, it is easy to understand how, as recently as 10 years ago, most aviation experts would have bet against the prospect of open skies between our two countries. The US-Japan Open Skies Agreement that we concluded in 2010 helped propel our air services relationship into the modern era. This agreement was a predicate for the Department of Transportation to grant antitrust immunity to the metal neutral alliances between Japan Airlines and American Airlines and between All Nippon Airways and United Airlines. Over the past nine years, since the agreement entered into force, average fares have decreased 21% in the US-Japan market, while the number of departures has increased 26%. While the 2010 Open Skies Agreement was an important step forward, it remained imperfect because opportunities at one of Japan's most important gateway airports, Tokyo Haneda, continued to be severely constrained for the carriers of both countries. With the deployment of new aircraft technologies over this same period, the route networks connecting our countries changed almost overnight. New cities like San Diego, Boston, and San Jose gained nonstop access to the Japan market for the first time, while frequency of service between Tokyo and established US gateways like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, and New York increased. This expansion in both the scope and depth of our bilateral connectivity came against a backdrop of increasing non-stop flights between the United States and other countries in East Asia, demonstrating that the US-Japan market would remain the linchpin of trans-Pacific traffic flows despite the growth in other markets. I believe that the 2019 amendment to our air transport agreement will ensure that the US-Japan market continues to prosper in the years ahead. 
Beginning in March of next year, 36 round-trip flights will connect Tokyo's Haneda Airport to the United States each day. This is on top of services from Narita, Osaka, Nagoya, and elsewhere in Japan to cities in the United States, from Boston to Guam. This newly liberalized operating environment will provide our respective carriers with the flexibility they need to maintain competitiveness against other airlines operating in the trans-Pacific space and beyond. And with nonstop flights between the US and Haneda increasing as of next summer from 12 to 36, 18 by US carriers and 18 by Japanese carriers, not only will passengers destined to and from Tokyo experience shorter transit times to and from the downtown core, but passengers destined to points throughout Japan's regions, from Kyushu to Hokkaido and all points in between, will find a myriad of new connecting flight possibilities at their disposal. This will undoubtedly enhance Japan's ability to achieve its ambitious goals for tourism growth over the next decade. Looking forward, it is my hope that we can continue to push the limits of our aviation relationship to our mutual benefit. Our 2019 amendment lays the groundwork for some important next steps, including the further liberalization of access at Haneda. In DOT's view, these next steps are critical to ensuring the competitive landscape remains vibrant. Artificially limiting the potential of our market does not serve any of our interests. Let us learn from our share, shared history and recognize that a Haneda that is open to all on the same basis as every other airport governed by our agreement will remain our priority as we look to the future. In addition, we are very encouraged by the plans for a third runway at Narita as Japan sets out to achieve its ambitious goals of 40 million foreign visitors in 2020 and 60 million by 2030, Narita's role as an international gateway may be changing, but it is by no means diminished. We believe a third runway will present opportunities for more service in both the passenger and cargo markets. We hope that it will also present opportunities for new entrants in our air transport market as new business models emerge in the Trans-Pacific and beyond. Narita has proven to be one of the most efficient gateways between the United States and Asia, and I believe this role will continue as more U.S. cities look to gain nonstop non access across the Pacific. As recent history has demonstrated, the strong bonds between our two countries have ensured that our aviation relationship has continued to thrive despite tremendous growth in other areas of the Asia-Pacific region. This is in large part due to the solid relationship we share as partners and the positive business environment and legal certainty that results for our airlines. While other areas of the Asia-Pacific region may continue to expand aviation infrastructure and to chart ever bolder ambitions for growing trans-Pacific traffic, I do not believe what we have accomplished is easily replicated, for it is rooted in a deep sense of respect for one another and for the rule of law. It is my hope that as we continue to work with one another, to further liberalize the US-Japan market, we will keep this in mind. And so now, summing up, let's just have a look. Uh, this is what the route network of both US and Japanese carriers looked like in the 1950s. This is what it looks like today. And please don't ask me to name all the gateways. I don't think I could do it. So I look forward to hearing from the other keynote speakers here today and the panel members that will follow. And to my Japanese counterparts, I look forward to continuing to work constructively with you as we chart the next chapter in our aviation relationship. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Short.
forward. Our final keynote speaker is Mr. Tamara. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Good afternoon, Your Excellency, our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this kind of a very uh, precious opportunity. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, make uh, to talk at the uh, uh, this uh, Civil Aviation uh, Symposium uh, uh, sponsored by your GD. Uh, today, I'd like to make a presentation on uh, how we think to secure our uh, future uh, growth of a uh, uh, Narita International Airport. Next, please. Yes. Air passenger traffic in Asia is forecasted to grow at an annual average rate of uh, uh, above 5% over the next 20 years against the backdrop of the uh, region's robust economic growth. Uh, in addition, the demand for air transportation between Asia and North America is uh, also forecasted to grow steadily. The number of inbound tourists uh, visiting Japan is expected to increase uh, further over the coming years. Uh, the Japanese government is targeting a, a for a 40 million inbound tourists in 2020 and a 6 million in 2030. Uh, and the government has imp implemented and continues to implement uh, vigorous and various policy measures to uh, promote inbound tourism, including uh, strategic easing of uh, visa requirements and the uh, improvement of the uh, tourism environment for foreign visitors to Japan. Uh, taking a look at the, uh, our neighboring Asian countries, Major airports are carrying out a large-scale expansion projects uh, to uh, capture the growing uh, uh, demand. And as uh, each airport is preparing a very large handling uh, capacity, our competition among airports will uh, intensify on the one hand, and uh, this could be a threat to the uh, growth of our airports uh, in the Tokyo metropolitan area, uh, that is the uh, Haneda and Narita. On the other hand, those are expanded airports will provide opportunities for us to uh, attract new services to, from, and via Tokyo. Narita Airport plans to cope with the threats and uh, take advantage of the opportunities by jointly serving the uh, Tokyo metropolitan area uh, with uh, Haneda through a close cooperation between the uh, two airports. By the uh, Olympic and the Paralympic Games to be held in uh, Tokyo next year, uh, the annual airport capacity is planned to be increased by 40,000 aircraft movements for uh, each of Narita and Haneda. Beyond 2020, uh, Narita Airport has a concrete expansion plan to further strengthen its functionality and expand its capacity by an additional uh, 100, 160,000 aircraft movements to uh, 500,000 movements annually. Haneda will open up a new approach route for the planned capacity increase next summer, which flies over the center of Tokyo City uh, only from 3 uh, to 7 p.m. in consideration of the living environment for the residents. The room for further capacity expansion uh, for Haneda would be quite limited. That means that most of the demand increase in the Tokyo metropolitan area beyond 2020 is to be accommodated by Narita Airport. Now uh, let me explain about the three points of our Narita Airport's uh, further capacity and the functionality enhancement. Uh, firstly, the annual number of arrival and departure slots will be increased from uh, 300,000 to 500,000, as I mentioned earlier. Secondly, runway B will be extended by 1,000 meters to uh, 3,500 meters, and runway C, uh, another runway with the uh, length of uh, 300, 500 uh, meters, will be newly constructed. As a result, Narita uh, Airport will have three runways with the uh, length of uh, either 3,000, uh, 4,000, or the uh, 3,500 meters. Thirdly, the airport's aircraft operating hours which is currently from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m., will be extended by two and a half hours and will become from 5 a.m. to 12.30 a.m. when runway C is constructed and put to use. Narita is expected to accommodate the future growth of the overseas tourist demand to Tokyo 
and to overall Japan. So uh, we are making full efforts to implement uh, these changes to fulfill our responsibility to the national aviation system. In the planned third increase in arrival and the departure slot capacity for international services at Haneda, an additional 50 day, daily uh, daytime turnaround slots are allocated for flights, and uh, 25 for Japanese carriers and uh, 25 for uh, foreign carriers. And presently, direct flight services from Narita are operated to all of these countries to which additional uh, slots uh, at Haneda are allocated. In particular, 12 turnaround slots are awarded to flights to and from the United States. Uh, four U.S. carriers have been awarded approval from the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation to operate a total of 12 flights uh, per day from uh, 10 cities in the U.S. Uh, to complement the same volume, two Japanese carriers plan to start operating at 12 flights per day. At present, from Narita, 331 passenger flights to 19 U.S. cities, including Guam, are being operated, so Narita's network is expected to be uh, affected to a substantial extent. Last time, when the second increase of the international slot to Haneda started to be allocated in 2014, the performance of Narita was largely affected for that year. However, next year, it achieved better results compared to 2013, before our Haneda slot increase, in terms of three major benchmarks, the number of arrivals and the departures, the number of passengers, and the number of cities served by the flights from the airport. Uh, <clears throat> And moreover, this time, uh, the uh, restrictions on the transportation capacity for the uh, Chinese carriers at Narita are to be substantially relaxed to the uh, level where uh, we could call it almost the open skies. Uh, considering these changes in the uh, business environment, I believe uh, Narita will uh, bounce back in a short period of time and further attract international passenger and cargo uh, demand and also expand its uh, uh, domestic service network utilizing the increased uh, airport capacity. Once again, uh, I'd like to uh, reiterate that uh, one of Narita Airport's uh, advantages is the uh, planned increase in uh, arrival and uh, departure slots. Uh, we will take uh, three steps. For the first step, uh, starting with the uh, winter 2019 schedule, the airport's uh, flight operational hours will be extended by one hour with the uh, curfew delayed to uh, 12 a.m. midnight. At the same time, the restrictions on uh, the number of flights operable at uh, 10 p.m. for uh, runway A will be removed. For the second step, by the time of the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games, the number of hourly arrival and departure slots uh, will be increased from uh, 68 to uh, 72, uh, including the time zone from uh, 3 p.m. to 7 a.m that is a convenient to schedule for flights to and from both North America and Asia. For the third step, for the third step with the further enhancement of the uh, Narita Airport's uh, capacity and the functionalities, including the uh, construction of a runway C, a new runway, uh, which is uh, intended to be completed in the uh, latter half of the 2020s, the number of hourly arrival and departure slots will be increased from a 72 to a 98 in addition, the flight operational hours will be further extended by one and a half hours to be from 5 a.m. to 12.30 a.m. Narita's second advantage is that it links the Tokyo metropolitan area with the various Asian cities and the network with the Asian cities will grow richer year by year. Narita serves Tokyo, one of the world's largest cities in terms of the demand for air transportation. Uh, making, uh, by uh, making the most of the planned increase in an annual arrival and departure slots and uh, consequently greater flexibility in uh, scheduling for the airlines. Narita will be able to link uh, this uh, mega city, Tokyo metropolitan area, uh, with a wider range of uh, Asian cities. When it comes to flights to China, as of the end of uh, September 2019, 21 cities in China are connected by flights from Narita. And as I touched upon uh, earlier, the authorities of China and Japan agreed to ease the restrictions on uh, 
transportation capacity for Narita services, starting with the winter 2019 schedule. And now, early, uh, nearly 100 new flights from uh, Chinese cities to Narita are applied and uh, under uh, preparation for a starting service. Currently, there are 17 Chinese cities which have been served by flights from Kansai and Chuba airports, but not from Narita. However, under the new almost open skies scheme for Narita introduced between China and Japan, we will step up marketing efforts so that Narita will be the main gate from China to Japan. As for flights to Southeast Asia and India, uh, the densely populated and the fast-growing areas with great potential, 17 cities are served by flights from Narita at this moment. And more cities are to be added to the list in the very near future. For example, on this coming October 27th, ANA will start the Narita Chennai service, while JAL will open the Narita Bangalore as a route by the time of the uh, 2020 summer schedule. Furthermore, there are 18 major cities in Southeast Asia which are not served by flights from Narita. Not a few locals carriers are planning to introduce aircraft with a longer flying range, and uh, thus uh, this will uh, uh, definitely be a good opportunity for Narita to uh, enrich its flight service network. Narita's uh, third advantage is its greater role in the growing LCC market in Japan. Locust carriers are increasing their market share in regions around the world. However, in Northeast Asia, their share is only 13.8%, the lowest in the world, which means that there's still large potential for future growth. At Narita, LCC's share, which was 1.5% in terms of the number of arrival and departure slots in 2011, uh, that was before Japanese locals carriers started uh, service, service uh, is, is expected to grow to a 32 percent uh, in fiscal 2019. And that will grow to a 50 percent when the uh, annual capacity of uh, slots has been uh, increased to uh, 500,000 uh, uh, per year. Now I'd like to introduce our initiatives being carried out at Narita. Narita is striving to become the airport of a choice for both passengers and carriers by increasing a convenience and satisfaction. To improve customer satisfaction, it's necessary to fully identify Narita Airport's present position in the market and understand the needs of passengers and carriers through market research and analysis as a matter of course. Narita is steadily improving its uh, total cooperation together with the uh, stakeholders by setting strategic goals for the uh, fast travel initiatives uh, promoted by IATA. Furthermore, Narita will significantly increase uh, convenience and comfort by introducing the One ID facial recognition system by spring uh, 2020. Through these measures, Narita will pursue greater convenience and comfort for passengers and the saving of labor and manpower for uh, carriers. Narita has also implemented the uh, one-stop security system, which eliminates the need for uh, transit passengers flying via Narita from the United States to undergo uh, redundant security checks during Narita Airport. This will benefit all carriers, passengers, and the airport. At present, the one-stop security system covers just under 60% of the uh, 48 flights per day from the uh, U.S., but the coverage will be expanded to all of the flights uh, uh, from this November on. This will greatly uh, reduce stress for uh, transit uh, passengers from the United States. Since introducing the narrative marketing initiatives are in the 2013 uh, for carriers with the uh, incremental tonnage, uh, Narita has uh, enhanced uh, incentive measures while uh, analyzing the market trends. Narita will flexibly implement, implement uh, strategic pricing, uh, including new or incentives from the uh, viewpoints of uh, destination cities, time zones, and uh, implementation period while uh, keeping a close watch on the external environment. Especially, we consider that the flights to North America are very important, so we will listen to airlines and uh, introduce the necessary measures. 
Based on the market analysis, uh, Narita will implement uh, measures to reduce the total travel cost for passengers and the total operating cost for uh, carriers. For passengers, in order to reduce the total travel cost for passengers, we will provide a variety of uh, flight options through uh, enriching our air network, including uh, full services and uh, low-cost services, and increase access options by expanding the uh, network of uh, low-cost bus uh, services for around $10 uh, from the Narita to all major terminals in Tokyo. For carriers, Narita will uh, introduce a comprehensive fee system that uh, contributes to promoting the fast travel initiatives and the one ID facial recognition system, as well as to improving the efficiency of check-in counters while uh, reducing the operating cost through the saving of manpower. And further efforts will be made to reduce total costs for carriers. Well, in summary, uh, Narita Airport will continue to increase its capacity and enhance functionality steadily. That way, it can meet growing demand for air transportation in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, which is uh, expected to grow strongly against the backdrop of Asia's robust economic growth. And also it can meet demand for two-way tourism with large potential in the uh, Tokyo metropolitan area, which has the world's largest urban population, about 38 million people. Narita Airport will strive to expand its uh, network of uh, flight services to and from Asian cities, including a large number of cities not served by flights from Haneda, through capitalizing on its advantage as the only airport in the Tokyo metropolitan area to further expand the capacity substantially beyond the 2020. Narita's arrival and the departure slots will be increased by nearly 70% from the current number. To make that possible, Narita will uh, collaborate with the uh, full service carriers and low cost carriers using Narita as their key airport and achieve growth together. FSCs and LCCs will act as the twin drivers for the growth of Narita's network. Narita Airport will support those airlines so that they can both grow at Narita. They will both further strengthen your Asian flight network by capturing the increasing demand in the region. Over the medium to long term, we will rebuild Narita's network of North American routes by fully utilizing the expanded Asian network to capture transit demand for flights between Asia and the North America. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to all of our keynote speakers for their engaging presentations. This concludes the first session of our symposium. Now we'd like to take a 15 minute uh, coffee break in the foyer behind you. During this time, if you would like to begin filling out the surveys at your seats, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, next on the agenda is the panel discussion, which will begin at 4.35 p.m. We will alert you when it's time to return to your seats. Thank you. <laughs>